We are good to go. Yeah. Greetings from Informa Markets. I'm your host, Ahmed, and I welcome you to the webinar, Green Hydrogen Enabling the Energy Transition. Change is the only constant in life, and what a transition from the medieval times of producing energy to burning wood, and to today's time, whereby we not only talk about green, clean, renewable energy, but also talk about producing energy through water. Without further ado, I would like to call upon Mr. Radnish Khattar, Senior Group Director in Former Markets in India, to welcome our guests, panelists, and the audience who join us from over 20 countries. Radnish. Many thanks, Amit. And uh, at the outset, welcome everyone. All our uh, you know, galaxy of uh, speakers, galaxy of panelists who was with us on board today, and uh, all those who are joining the webinar today. Let me tell you that it's a very interesting subject. It's something which India is really, really up to, and we are looking forward to make it big in this uh, domain. And as I can see, the panel is extremely balanced. We have three international friends joining us from France, Canada, and uh, Germany. And of course, we have our own Indian uh, friends uh, from DNV, from Jackson, and of course, Dr. Malhotra, right? And uh, so welcome everyone. And, uh, and, and before we go further, let me also thank our supporting chamber, Indian Indo-American Chamber of Commerce and associate partner in DNV. Gentlemen and friends, as we all know that India is recently notified a policy on green hydrogen and green ammonia. And I think this is going to be like a major policy enabler by the government for not only production of green hydrogen and green ammonia, but also using renewable energy sources in a big way. And as we all know that when we were on the 75th independence day on 15th of August, that was the day when the National Hydrogen Mission uh, was uh, launched by our uh, Honorable Prime Minister. Now, the mission itself aims to aid the government in meeting its climate change and, of course, making India a green hydrogen hub. So today, as I, I was just talking uh, uh, pre-webinar that uh, 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 Dr. Malhotra will be our, so I'll be attending almost like uh, uh, like, like, like a tutorial to all of us, because he's one man who is uh, being in the capacity of uh, president of uh, Indian Hydrogen Association. You know, we look forward to uh, a wonderful session because when India is embarking upon this journey, India is talking about not a small number by any means, which is like we talk about uh, per target of producing 5 million metric tons of green hydrogen by the year 2030 and the related development which will happen in the due course from renewable capacity. From one of my very small experience when I was at one of the conference, it also said that when you talk about 5 million metric tons of green hydrogen by 2030, India needs 212 gigawatt of solar photovoltaic. It needs 141,000 hectares of the land. And last but not the least, it needs 168 billion liters of water, which is required to produce this. By all means, by all numbers, these are these are these are uh, the, the great things, you know. And I'm sure uh, India should be able to uh, uh, reach that numbers, you know, what India's dream ambition is. And this is this is the very reason that this event of today, the webinar, is our curtain raiser for the giant step which we are going to take towards end of uh, September. And I'm sure my colleague will talk about it later. So without other further ado, let me just pass on the baton to uh, our good friend, Mr. Bhagatej Reddy. He's director from PwC. And uh, we have our co-moderator, Mr. Somas, who is the uh, founder of Clean Tech Business Club. So over to you, Bhagya Tej. And thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful uh, 60 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Rajneesh. Thanks, Amit. <clears throat> good afternoon for those joining from India and for others across the world. Hope you're having a good day. On behalf of PwC India, I must thank Informa team for bringing together such varied professionals focusing on different aspects of hydrogen and renewable energy, and also from different geographies. Over the last year, beyond what Rajneesh uh, mentioned on uh, National Hydrogen Mission uh, during Independence Day, there's another important announcement that uh, Indian Prime Minister has made at COP26. He has committed to lower India's GDP emissions by 45% by 2030. That is from 2005 levels. Let me explain what that target means. India emitted 340 grams of CO2 for $1 of GDP output in 2005. The corresponding number, latest corresponding number is about 260 grams in 2019. Or in other words, there has been about 2 percentage, uh, 2 percentage 
a two percentage decrease on an annualized basis on intensity of uh, GHG emissions per unit of GDP. But to achieve the COP26 target of 45% lower emissions, the decline has to be much steeper. It has to be almost at 4% area on year. And the emission reduction is, is uh, facilitated the last time around uh, till so far by renewables and energy efficient measures. But going, going forward, these two alone are not likely to be sufficient. The efforts and the emphasis has to be channeled towards hard to abate sectors, that is, iron, steel, and cement, which contribute to 62% of our emissions, apart from chemicals and transport. Therefore, green hydrogen provides a credible route to decarbonize these energy intensive sectors. And they, it also has a huge role to play as an energy storage for the power sector. And therefore, the hydrogen mission that was launched earlier, to, uh, earlier this year in February, which targets 5 million metric tons of green hydrogen to be produced by 2030, could not be more timely. So government of India is keen to encourage production of green hydrogen and also green ammonia and has taken steps to promote this space. The private sector is also acting swiftly to address this challenge. On one hand, the oil and gas companies are creating supply uh, or rather are creating demand, while on the other hand, the supply is being committed by renewable energy companies. Now, before we get on to the debate and uh, sufficiency of government's initiatives or private sector uh, plans, I request the distinguished panel members to introduce themselves, uh, starting with Thomas. Thomas, you're on mute. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this introduction. And uh, thank you so much, uh, dear team of uh, Renewable Energy India, Rajnish and Amit for organizing this. And I'm really looking forward to cooperating with you guys on uh, green hydrogen, because we are working together since I think like 15 years on renewable energies. And as uh, our co-chair of uh, Green Hydrogen Hub in the club, Adamo Skrenci, who uh, founded uh, hydrogen business at Thyssen 30 years ago, is saying renewables and hydrogen are the best friends forever. Yes. So within the club, uh, we are covering uh, all the technologies. Uh, we have members in uh, 36 countries. and. Uh, we believe that uh, hydrogen is a huge opportunity for the clean tech industry, yes? And that's why we created the hub uh, within each. Uh, we are uniting leaders from all the continents in order to help the industry to mature from the early stage uh, where we are now, like we were in the early stage 20 years ago with, with renewables. So I think that uh, it's very interesting now to learn from the speakers, what is the situation in India? And later I will a bit uh, tell you from our perspective, how we, we see um, the hydrogen opportunity in Europe, but also international cooperation between Europe and India. Thanks, thanks, sir. thanks too much. Uh, Dr. Malhotra, can you introduce yourself for a minute? Uh, I have a, a background of oil and gas industry. I have worked in the uh, largest commercial enterprise of India, the Indian Oil Corporation, for uh, nearly four decades uh, uh, in their research and development. And uh, although uh, the, we have been doing the traditional refining and marketing business, but uh, during my tenure as uh, the at the R&D and particularly at the top as director R&D on the board of Indian Oil Corporation, I had uh, initiated a lot of work on uh, renewables, etc. And that's uh, and then later on I was the director general of the Federation of Indian Petroleum Industry and I've been propagating there also on how to you know get into uh, the energy transition and then of course the energy transition uh, will have to be uh, leading us to renewables uh, which will be replacing the fossil oil and gas uh, sources which we have been using traditionally. Uh, how soon or how later it will happen that's a, a matter of debate and. Uh, as far as hydrogen is concerned, we have been uh, producing, we are the largest producers and consumers of hydrogen in the oil industry, in the refineries. Uh, we have been doing it from oil and natural gas mostly. And uh, now there is a policy which was mentioned by Mr. Qatar that uh, something around that is happening. Uh, I, have, uh, I had set up the hydrogen association when I was at Indian Oil long back. And we have been doing annual conferences every year on hydrogen and fuel cells. And that uh, our next conference we have already announced will be on 4th to 6th of December at New Delhi. 
and we expect large gathering this time because there is it has gathered so much of momentum in last couple of years during this pandemic particularly we could not organize our full flesh conference so uh, we expect a uh, lot many people to come here besides that i am uh, uh, after my retirement from the federation of petroleum industry i am also the adjunct professor of practice at the indian institute of technology new delhi also so this is my background thanks thanks dr madhutra uh, rolf can you share it? your background. Things are mute. Thank you. Uh, so Rolf Berndt, I uh, currently work for GIZ as a senior hydrogen advisor. I used to be with the World Bank. I spent 15 years on private and financial sector development, and where, of course, I spent also a lot of time in, in, in renewables. I think so what I'm bringing to the table today is perhaps less the hydrogen or uh, renewable industry is perspective, but I think much more the broader perspective, how does one help industries to transform? How can one help industries actually to accelerate, especially what policies can government uh, introduce and uh, to look at beyond individual firm level, but also at sector level. Uh, and so this is where I especially think the World Bank experience is relevant. A GSF at the moment is now launching a project on scaling up hydrogen projects. So the, uh, I think Bikesh and I agree uh, I'm sure the biggest will agree with me later on. We see huge potential in India, especially in green ammonia. Hydrogen specific in that it's hard to transport. Ammonia is much easier to transport. It will be huge demand. Um, I think I agree with what uh, Bakichi said about the, let's focus on the core uh, industries which are hard to decarbonize. I would only add shipping to that. Um, and GSM will be looking at ways of both to have individual pilot projects but also looking at how to create clusters um, and not to make the clusters open for all kinds of different sectors, not just the fertilizer and the, um, and the refinery sector. So we're grateful. We believe that actually the Indian government in this first part of the hydrogen mission has really set out really great incentives. We're waiting for the second part to come out with the blending quotas, which actually create even stimulate more demand and create a level playing field across different sectors. Um, let me perhaps stop there. Uh, and that particular answer will go in more detail later on. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Rolf. Avid, can you go next? Thank you. Uh, good morning, morning, afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you from Canada. Thank you very much to the Renewable Energy Growth Forum uh, for the invitation and meet for the coordination and the team um, for the good um, and engaging conversations that we're going to have today. Uh, my name is Yvette Vera Perez, and I am the president and CEO of the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Sales Association. Uh, this is a pan-Canadian organization, um, and uh, the mission is to be the voice for the hydrogen sector in Canada. Uh, we are an ecosystem uh, builder and uh, coordinator uh, with industry, government, um, academia and, and other spaces trying to develop uh, the sector and thriving to um, to build a hydrogen economy in Canada. I'm very happy to say that um, we have a long-standing MOU with the Hydrogen Association of India since 2015. We have developed a number of uh, trade missions with each other's um, countries, and uh, there have been lots of fruitful uh, relationships uh, for a number of decades already. Uh, that we have developed uh, between Canada and India. I hope, uh, I'm gonna leave it short now as, as the introduction, but I have. I, I hope that I have the chance later to uh, to give you some examples of collaboration. And of course, I will make the uh, call to action that we would definitely like more collaboration and uh, an increased um, relationship between both countries. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bikesh. Bikesh, you're on mute. My bad apologies. Uh, I said good afternoon and good morning to all my fellow panelists. And uh, thank you, Tej, for giving me this opportunity to really express myself, you know, about uh, my views on how we are panning out on the hydrogen and ammonia space. Yeah, so I, I represent Jackson. Uh, you know, it's a very unique, one of the very unique combination of EPC plus manufacturing rolled into one. So I have very, very recently started this stint in Jackson. You know, embarking on a journey that will, you know, we will try and make ourselves significant stakeholders in both the manufacturing side as well as on the EPC side, deployment side, which is. And uh, I come in prior to this from a background of solar EPC. I have been in energy and construction for the last 25 years. 
Uh, incidentally, I work for a company by name Sterling and Wilson Solar and uh, was uh, responsible for scaling the business from scratch, uh, you know, to almost 31 countries, 12,000 12, megawatts, you know, and uh, I can clearly see uh, the same inflection point of hydrogen space as we as I saw solar PV and as Thomas mentioned that there's a lot of romance between the renewables and the hydrogen so I, I come in with the with the uh, renewable uh, you know background and I'm sure I'll be able to create and blossom the romance on the hydrogen side of it so there's a brief about me uh, uh, Bhagatej thank you well, thanks 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 Alok uh, Alok from DNA can you share your background and uh, your experiences Good afternoon uh, this is Alok Kumar I'm market area manager for renewables in DNA uh, so I have been in deep cleaning for more than 13 years now. And in the last 15 years, I have worked on wind, solar, and energy storage, and now on hydrogen phase. Uh, DNV is basically a Norwegian foundation, more than 150 years old company with operation in more than 100 countries. And as per the statute of the foundation, we need to invest 5% of our revenue every year on R&D. And in, in the last few years, a large part of our R&D fund has been going to the hydrogen. And we are coming up with the certification guideline for electrolyzer. We are also working on some safety aspects uh, for the pipeline. And uh, we have set up several uh, laboratories as well as experimental uh, you know, full scale uh, testing set up across the world. So that's a brief about it. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, panelists, for sharing your background. So, uh, Today's discussion, uh, we are planning to have it in three buckets, one on the supply side of hydrogen, the second on manufacturing part of hydrogen, and third on the demand side of hydrogen. So first, on the first segment, you know, we, we know that there is a national green hydrogen policy which has been announced uh, to reduce cost of electricity. And uh, uh, this is in addition to government's uh, government of India's push for setting up manufacturing zones focused on renewable energy, including for green hydrogen manufacturing. So my first question on the supply side is to Dr. Malhotra, who was instrumental in setting up IOCL's pilot plan. Sir, uh, what reforms do you think are needed to incentivize electricity production from greener sources, be it solar, wind, or hydro? You see, uh, uh, government has already, as you are aware, have already said that uh, the transmission charges would be waived if the green electricity is to be used for hydrogen production. But there are a lot of uh, lot of ifs and buts at this point of time because uh, uh, the uh, it's not a central government has announced this policy, but uh, uh, the state subject, you know, uh, the, it is not uh, the power transmission is not only governed by the central laws. You know, there are states involved, and uh, I've been talking to various people, and they say that the the cost of electricity, even if it is uh, uh, two rupees uh, per kilowatt hour at the generation point. Uh, mm -hmm. Even with the uh, reforms which have been announced, it will be four to five rupees per kilowatt hour. And if I don't know, you may, it might be you know the uh, consulting firms might have done better calculations. Uh, but uh, the cost of hydrogen, green hydrogen, that way would be would be fairly exorbitant. That's the concern. So uh, obviously uh, we need to uh, see that uh, how these policies are going to be implemented. And then I was also talking in the morning in the forenoon with someone and uh, I said the government must incentivize. Then they said if the government, uh, you know, gives all the green electricity a waiver kind of thing, you know, then no transmission charge. Hello. I believe there's a network issue which is coming. Dr. Murata, you're on mute. So, sorry about it. There is some signal uh, connectivity problem today. So, uh, the issue is that uh, uh, people will have to, uh, you know, lay down the infrastructure for transmission, etc. And then the uh, this issue of uh, uh, costing and uh, reaching of the electricity, you know, uh, at the point where people want to generate green hydrogen will have to be resolved. If it is, it continues to be costly, then green hydrogen obviously will be costly. So uh, this is one issue, primary issue, I think, uh, the, is the cost of hydrogen. And then if you produce hydrogen near the place of uh, electricity generation to avoid these charges, you know, interstate transmission, etc., 
then the cost of transportation of hydrogen is fairly large. So either way, you get a hit. You know, so uh, the technologies for uh, transport. Uh, in at times, you know, we find that the cost of transporting hydrogen will be more than the cost of production of hydrogen. So uh, this these are some of the issues which are yet to be resolved uh, to make uh, this a very you know uh, extremely viable uh, option. So uh, there is a concern that uh, government is trying to make a policy that people will have to use uh, refineries and fertilizer units. The compulsory hydrogen will have to be used compulsorily on the demand side, you said. I should answer. And then when I've been talking to some of my refinery friends, they are very you know, much concerned that presently they have been producing it from their resources of natural gas or oil. Uh, of course, natural gas at this point of time is expensive. Uh, but... Uh, they say that our uh, own setup for producing hydrogen will become idle. And if we have to buy hydrogen in an expensive uh, way, our uh, fuel costs will be will be higher. And, uh, uh, you know, the government should be willing to compensate them for, uh, the, for increasing the cost of their uh, refinery products. So these are mm -hmm. some of the you know, uh, difficult situations. And if in case of fertilizers, it's, it's even more difficult because... Uh, if you you know force the fertilizer industry to use green hydrogen at a more uh, uh, at a higher cost as compared to the hydrogen traditionally they have been using, uh, then the subsidy for fertilizers will go up. You know they will have to be subsidized. Of course, government right. may say that oil sector has got deep pockets, so they may not compensate the refineries, but fertilizer sector cannot survive without those kind of compensations. So these are the issues which have been uh, of concern and have been delaying the second phase of the policy announcements, etc., uh, which has been going around with the government. And uh, so I think these so, issues need to be resolved if we have to make it a viable option. So Dr. Madhatra, again, we'll come back to the demand side of it, know which sector will take a priority. Uh, so my next question is to roll from the same subject. So how do you think Indian government approach or rather how do you see indian government's approach differing from the european one uh, where we see you know uh, this space is slightly advanced compared to what where we are in india rolf uh, any I views from you think there's some yeah. signal problem again so can you hear me all good okay yeah okay. I would actually make the picture a bit more nuanced and not that one-sided so I actually have appreciation actually for some good, uh, let's say, points the Indian government has made, as much as I agree with uh, Mr. Malhotra that the transition fees, if it works at state level, and of course the concern of the individual sectors. Um, so if you look at Europe, I think Europe is also trying with, uh, let's say, blending quotas. It has blending quotas for steel at 50%. It's trying to go even go up, I believe, now to 75% as blending quotas for some fuel for aviation, which is only 2%. Uh, but Europe, the, I think they're still struggling in other areas. Um, what you find in both countries at the moment is the challenge of the offtake. There's lots of enthusiasm of producers to produce. Uh, and the challenge is simply on the cost side. And that while the producer is willing to invest, they don't have the offtake at the moment. Uh, and so the buyer is not really willing to engage. And therefore, I do believe that the demand interventions are good. Europe is like, I think Germany is now has a lighthouse project, which is called the H2 Global, which is now for the first time trying to auction off hydrogen and trying to provide gap financing, uh, which is great. It will have much more of a, let's say, impact of the price that it achieves, really the, the volumes, but it will be important. Uh, but I do think that working more on the demand side is necessary uh, to bring the, and also to bring the cost down. A last point, um, where was I? I think that the, uh, we have a fertilizer, as I said, that shipping thing, um, is, 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 is needed. I think the, the point that everybody struggles most with is really the, the price, of, is the cost issue. And if you look at actually the, the current cost today, Green hydrogen is actually cheaper than gray, uh, gray hydrogen. Um, and that is simply because the gas prices are so high. And so if you, then you need, uh, need the next step is do you need a crystal ball then to say where the gas market going. And I recently had, I was in India, we had lots of discussions. As European, I'm more 
hesitant and more inclined to believe that the gas market will stay. Um, but that gets you into really the economics of where the gas goes, which then impacts then also your um, gray hydrogen and which at the moment, as I say, green hydrogen is actually cheaper. Um, you have the discussions, Mr. Mohotra said, what do you do with existing equipment? You can design policies around that to blend, I think the quotas are there to mainly to provide a slow blending and that would be necessary to allow existing equipment to be used to the, the end of its lifetime. Because otherwise the producers then of course have additional costs. So perhaps let me stop there. No, I think thanks. No, I think uh, I think that Lighthouse project is probably a good example of how you know uh, things have gotten uh, gotten ahead in Germany, for instance. Uh, so my next question again is to Thomas and Eva. You know, given your Canadian and European experiences, you know, uh, what do you think are the typical challenges in setting up of uh, hydrogen infrastructure, uh, be it storage or transport, and uh, how did uh, you no know, companies in Europe and Canada have overcome that? I can start, Thomas, if you would like. Yes, of course. So, so uh, challenges in infrastructure were uh, very many, and uh, Dr. Malhotra um, and Rolf said a little bit um, about it, right? There's always the bit of uh, the chicken and egg situation. Uh, we want to, to, to boost the supply, but obviously we need the offtake agreements. So we need the demand. A lot of the, uh, the companies are not able to, 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 to get the financing to be those projects, those production projects, because they have not got um, a firm offtake agreement. So investment and economics is one, right? So build the demand and attract the users. What we're doing in Canada, part of the Canadian um, hydrogen strategy um, involves uh, the development of uh, 30 hubs around the country. So hubs that will uh, bring together uh, those hard to abate industry uh, consumers, for example, like steel and, and, and cement and others, but also those hubs we, would connect with each other uh, through corridors. And that's another hard to abate uh, um, space in Canada, especially heavy haul transport, right? Um, and, and, and eventually we would like to develop corridors east, west, and, 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 and north, south, right? And uh, so complex question, uh, infrastructure, um, one, building that demand. And then from a generation perspective as well, uh, we spoke about it a little bit, the cost part um, is, is, is critical. Uh, a number of, of our companies uh, are, are looking to acquire renewable energy assets um, or buying off the grid whenever that is possible and affordable uh, times of the day, et cetera. Uh, but a lot of our, um, our uh, hydro resources, for example, are quite tied with uh, already domestic production. So looking to, for example, develop offshore wind capabilities uh, could be an avenue. Uh, but a lot of the offshore wind um, uh, potential is far away from electricity uh, needs, right? From electricity centers. So obviously hydrogen uh, can be a, a possibility there. Um, a lot of our companies are looking also to, to localize in emerging markets, trying to break again that egg and, 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 and chicken and egg situation and try to find power where it is available uh, instead of asking the grid operators to build more. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, to, 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 uh, to fix those challenges around infrastructure is a matter of, at the end of the day, investment and economics and boosting that demand uh, through hubs and through centers where you can collect all those end users that, uh, that have a common interest in developing, uh, in lowering the cost of, of hydrogen. And then the producers can come in and partner with them and then the, the, the whole um, logistics and infrastructure around the hub is developed. So before Thomas answers this question, oh, one other point I would. So uh, is there a preference uh, for just green hydrogen or is there a transition via blue hydrogen? I think this is what Dr. Mahotra was mm -hmm. also mentioning in the call. So very, uh, yeah, very good question. Um, so 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 Canada. Uh, so the, the perception is uh, initially we are um, color agnostic, if you will. We're looking to focus on hydrogen intensity. Uh, on, on carbon intensity and uh, developing a number of uh, uh, methodologies for uh, life cycle analysis of the greenhouse gas production of different pathways of, uh, of hydrogen. Uh, because Canada is such a large country, 
and uh, different geographic areas have different core competencies and, 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 and uh, capabilities for hydrogen production, you will find that in the, Alber in the Alberta province, uh, there's uh, a lot of room for developing blue hydrogen. There's also a lot of knowledge of CCUS um, carbon um, capture and, and 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 sequestration. So and so 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 that's a good uh, good partnering of technologies. We have the largest um, blue hydrogen project in the world with about 120 million tons per day of hydrogen produced. Now the again the pathway is 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 towards green and the pathway is to lower that carbon intensity. Uh, more and more and policies, of course, are important to, to achieve these. Uh, but the knowledge and the experience that we gain from these projects is, is important also from an engineering perspective, from a materials perspective, storage, et cetera. Et cetera. So all that engineering and that knowledge is there and is, is completely transferable to green. Uh, hence the importance right now of those blue projects. But then when you look at Quebec and BC, then we would speaking about we would be speaking about green because of the natural resources in the provinces and the nature of the the types of projects that are being developed through electrolyzers etc. No, oh, that that's good to hear. No, you're playing to your strengths even when you're creating your hubs. No? Uh, so, Tomas, your experiences on infrastructure creation in Europe and, if possible, on the policy initiatives as well to substantiate. Uh... So, I think that uh, it was. Uh very good uh, mention that uh, we are in the chicken and egg situation, yes, actually. And this is actually the keyword uh, for the development of uh, hydrogen. It's I think it's in Europe, but also around the world, yes. So the target of uh, Europe is to have 20 million of uh, green hydrogen uh, by 2030. So half produced in Europe and half imported uh, from abroad, yes. So uh, we need to create the customers, yes, for this. So um, I think it's very important in Europe that after uh, the war started in Ukraine, so the green hydrogen is not only the solution for the climate, but it's also a very important solution for the energy security in Europe. Yeah? So there is a huge switch now in the mindset of uh, decision makers, but also utilities and all the big players in Europe really to switch as soon as possible to uh, hydrogen, yes? And uh, I mentioned it was green hydrogen, yes, because also Europe has a very ambitious targets uh, for, uh, you know, to become uh, zero emission, yes. And I think uh, what is very right. interesting is that we are at, at the very beginning, yes, of the, of the uh, hydrogen industry, like we were in Europe 20 years ago uh, with uh, renewable energies, yes. And uh, I remember 20 years ago, the solar energy market was thousand times smaller than today. Yes? So people were not believing how we can scale up so quickly. And I think, I think what is great with uh, hydrogen actually, that like in the past in solar industry, there were only small players yes, who are coming and then growing, growing the business. And in hydrogen is opposite, yes? Because the big players are interested to transfer, to transform their businesses into uh, hydrogen, yes? And I think uh, that maybe also the title of today's uh, uh, webinar should not be transition, but transformation. And we had this discussion with utilities in Europe, yes? So even utilities, they notice that it's not transition, energy transition, but it's true uh, transformation, yes? So I think uh, that there are different markets, yes? Uh, different markets that you would like to create. So a uh, very important market is the big guys like uh, steel industry, yes? So here already, I think one of the leading uh, uh, off takers is this one, and I think that recently they uh, signed some agreement with uh, Neom, so they will be importing uh, importing uh, green hydrogen from Neom in Saudi Arabia. Yes, mm -hmm. there is a lot of infrastructure which exists uh, for gas. Yes, and then uh, I think uh, in Germany, in some infrastructures, it's just ninety percent. Uh, uh, this infrastructure is, let's say, 90% ready even to uh, use it for uh, for hydrogen, yes? And it's okay. in Germany, there is also big infrastructure in uh, in uh, Italy, in, in France, et cetera, yes? So let's say that uh, we can uh, use this uh, infrastructure for uh, hydrogen, yes? And I think uh, in this uh, uh, 
this transition period, when we reach the true transformation, there is a, great, a, a big role for ammonia, yes, and for import of ammonia. And here, I think uh, in Europe, we have the leading port in uh, Rotterdam, which can become like a, a global uh, hub, yes, for, uh, for transportation of uh, ammonia from around the world and afterwards uh, distribution, yes. Hmm. Then uh, a big uh, customer will be, of course, uh, shipping industry. There is a big uh, discussion also on the uh, immobility industry, uh, how we create uh, the demand on the on the immobility sites. And I think there is a proposal in the legislation that 5% of the cars in the future, they should be uh, fueled by uh, green hydrogen. Yes. So this is like uh, we are discussing on the creation of the markets in Europe. On the other hand, we are giving the targets uh, for uh, how to create the demand. Yes. And I think Rolf was mentioning uh, how does it work also for, uh, for, for other markets. And then um, there is a uh, hydrogen coalition, yes, uh, in Europe uh, with uh, Hydrogen Europe, a very strong uh, organization in Europe, uh, driven by uh, Jorgo, who was a former MEP. And uh, they are working very closely with the European Commission in order to bring all the policies. Yes, so I think that until end of uh, June, all the states in Europe should approve the general uh, plan of the Commission how to uh, introduce uh, hydrogen, how to boost uh, green hydrogen in Europe. No, that's that's quite helpful, Thomas. You know, given a wholesome picture of what's happening both on the supply side, the policy. And also, uh, and also there is a big discussion about uh, setting up all the hubs, uh, regional hubs, country hubs, etc. Yes. So this is, I think, like uh, like uh, like in other in other countries. Oh, good to know. Good to know. So, Alok, uh, any any views on what could be the typical uh, safety issues or remedy measures that one should be cognizant of, uh, given that you know that infrastructure, especially in India, is fairly new, unlike, say, for instance, in Germany. Uh, what's your view, both on the supply side and also on the demand side, where it's getting utilized? Yeah, right. Uh, so, first, we need to understand that you know hydrogen. Uh, as an element itself is inherently less safe. I mean, if you look at its flammability range, it ranges from 4% to 75%. If you compare with natural gas, it is only 4% to 17%. Mm. If I look at ignition energy, you know, it requires very less energy, almost you know, 20 times less than what you would need for natural gas. Its uh, explosion pressure is too high. And also, it uh, you know requires very short distance to detonate what we call it TDT. Uh, so hydrogen usage is not new, right? I mean, the first time when hydrogen was artificially produced was in 16th century, and the electrolyzer were manufactured in 19th century. But so far, you know how hydrogen has been used in the most industrial setup where you have more control over the environment, you can actually ensure the safety. But when you are going to scale it up, then hydrogen is going to be in our home, hydrogen is going to be in the vehicles, hydrogen is going to be in the pipeline. And that is where, you know, safety becomes far more important than you know, the typical fuels that we are used to so far. Uh, if you look at the industry, what we find that for a small scale, you know, projects and the setup, you have the empirical data, you have the guidelines. But for the large scale, you know, you don't have the empirical data. You have the modeling, you have the safety tool. But we need to have the experimental setup to understand what would be the detonation pressure and why it will be required. 